I don't know about you, but when my uh, home phone rings, I'm like 80% sure most of the time that it's just a spam call. You know, someone, someone calling because they want you to give money to the so-and-so foundation or, or whatever. But some of these I, I pick up and I listen and see. Some of them I, I enjoy answering, including the, 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 the calls from the survey people. Do you all get calls from people who do surveys? Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll listen to those folks and I'll, I'll, I'll answer those. You, know, you pick up the phone and an automated voice tell uh, they want they want to know your question your they want to know your opinions on the state of things in the world right and uh, so they'll ask questions like do you approve or disapprove of the job so and so locally elected official is doing and you can click one for yes or two for no or they'll ask questions like uh, if the elections were held tomorrow would you vote for so and so local candidate or so and so other local candidate right and you can push a button on the phone and, and tell them. Or they ask questions like this, over the past few years, do you think the economy has improved or not improved or stayed about the same? Right? You guys have gotten these phone calls? Yeah. I, so we get those phone calls every now and then. The point of those surveys is, is they want you to evaluate the world around you. And, and most of us have no problem doing that. Most of us enjoy telling someone what we think about the world around us and what we think would, 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 would fix it. But I wonder, though, what would happen if you and I spent just half as much time evaluating our own souls as we did evaluating the world around us? What if we asked ourselves over the past few years, do you think the state of your soul has improved or not improved or stayed the same? Do you think your life looks more like Jesus or less like Jesus or stayed about the same? Most of us don't bother to ask those questions too often. They're a little bit more painful. And when we ask those questions, honestly, they reveal that most of us need to change. And I think if we were to be honest with each other, most of us would say, I don't really know how to change. Today, Paul is going to urge us to ask those kinds of questions of ourselves. And we're going to look at one of the most powerful, but often neglected ways that God can actually transform you and transform me. And it involves growing in the Spirit. So, Galatians chapter 5. We're going to read uh, the verses we studied last week and then pick back up with a couple verses we're going to look at today. So look at... Galatians 5, let's go back to verse 18. No, verse 19. Galatians 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, Divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Last week, if you were here with us, we, we, we compared two kinds of lifestyles. We looked at them in these verses. Two ways of living. The fruit of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Now our goal is to look more like the Spirit and not so much like the flesh. And we explained last week that the only way to have the fruit of the Spirit is to have the Spirit. And the only way to have the Holy Spirit is to be saved. 
It's to turn from our sins and to trust in Jesus. And at the moment we do that, God the Father sends the Holy Spirit into our lives. That said, the passage left us with a bit of a question. If we are Christians, if we do have the Holy Spirit, how do we then grow in that Spirit? How do we day by day choose to look less like that works of the flesh list and more like the fruit of the spirit list? That's the question Paul is going to help us answer today. And he gives us basically two steps. Two steps. First, crucify your sin. Crucify your sin. Look again at verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The first step then to growing in the Spirit is to be honest about where you struggle. To acknowledge that you and I have things in our lives, parts of our lives that do not honor God, that are contrary to the Spirit, And instead of indulging in those things, we crucify them. Again, Paul says, crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Crucify is a pretty graphic word, isn't it? Crucifixion was this awful, painful, violent means of execution. It was the very means that killed Jesus. But it's an appropriate comparison because crucifixion was shameful. I mean, you're hanging up there on these pieces of wood for everybody to see. And crucifying your sin is also shameful because you're acknowledging that you have parts of your life that are ugly, that fill you with regret. Crucifixion was shameful. Crucifixion was painful. I mean, it hurts to have nails through your hands and your feet. It hurts to be hanging there unable to gasp for breath. Crucifying your sin is also painful. It hurts to say no to yourself, to suffocate parts of yourself. Crucifixion was shameful. It was painful. It was slow. When you were crucified, you didn't die immediately. Death was a long, drawn-out process. Crucifying your sin is also slow. You're not going to go from impatient to patient overnight. You're not going to go from angry to loving overnight. It takes time to kill the sin. But the point is, over time, crucifixion kills. In the same way, over time, when you crucify your sins, they should also be killed. This is a powerful image to describe what God calls Christians to do. Crucify your flesh, he said, with its passions and desires. In other words, you're not just killing the sinful act. You're killing the motivation behind it that that produces that act. See, behind every sin, every act of disobedience, there's a desire or a passion that motivates it. For example, you don't just kill your pride, you kill the desire for attention that motivates your pride. You don't just kill your divisiveness, you kill the need to be right that motivates you to be divisive. So you identify your sin struggle and then you ask, why am I doing this? What is motivating me to do this particular thing? And then you crucify that thing. So the first step to growing in the Spirit is to crucify the parts of your life that don't look like Jesus. Maybe you're wondering, all right, what does this mean? How do I crucify parts of my life that don't like Jesus? Am I supposed to get a little cross out and put little nails on it and and do that? Practically, here's what we're talking about. You you identify your sin struggles. Identify your sin struggles. And and if you're drawing a blank on where you're sinful, uh, if if you don't think you you have anything that's messed up, try, try asking your spouse. Okay, They will let you know where you're falling short. Try asking a family member or a child. They'll be sure to tell you where where, where you need to fix yourself. But for real though, ask someone. Say, where where do you see in my life that I'm a little off course? Where do you see me going off track? 
Or I find lists like this one helpful. We mentioned the fruit of the flesh. Those lists are helpful. You read them and you feel the Spirit ding you a couple times. You think, maybe, maybe this is something I need to work on. So you identify your sin struggles and then you take drastic measures to kill it. In other words, you don't coddle your sin. You don't play with it. You ruthlessly attack it. So for example, say you do this and, and, and you identify that, that, that you struggle with pride. Pride, this elevated notion of yourself. Then one way you can attack it and kill it is you daily ask God to remind you how small you are in the scope of the universe. All of us think we're big shots, but in the scope of the universe, our earth is just a pinprick. And we're just a pinprick on a pinprick, right? If you discover you struggle with anger, try to identify the root causes of, of why you're angry. And ask hard questions about what, why these things make you upset. If you struggle with envy, maybe take a break from the Facebook and Instagram for a while so you don't have everyone else's picture-perfect life shoved in your face. If you find you struggle with lust, maybe you should quit visiting those websites or stop watching those shows or, or movies or be around those people that feed that lust. If you discover you struggle with fear, Ask hard questions about what is it that is motivating and triggering this fear. The point is you, you intentionally take drastic, potentially life-altering steps to kill the sin and to kill it at its root. In other words, you should kill your sin with the same tenacity that Adrian Monk kills germs. How many of you know who Adrian Monk is? You might remember that show on... on Okay, Casey remembers Adrian Monk really, really good. Okay, uh, there's a show on on USA 15 years ago called Monk, and Adrian Monk is kind of like a modern day Sherlock Holmes who is super germaphobic and neurotic. Like he has to ha everything in his house has right angles and it's all perfectly aligned, and he, he vacuums every day. You know, and he's he's a germaphobe. Adrian Monk hates germs, and there's an episode of Monk where. Uh, police captain Stottlemyre has to come stay at his house for a couple of days. And uh, the captain, he stays, so he stays on Monk's couch. He sleeps the night at Monk's house. And the next day he goes into work and his buddy says, what's wrong? You look completely exhausted. And the captain says, I didn't sleep. I woke up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. And Monk went in after me to clean the bathroom. And he says, and he was in there for an hour and a half. Right? Adrian Monk, Adrian Monk hates germs. He, 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 he wants to kill germs. He goes to all levels to exterminate them. That's kind of a picture of what God's calling us to do with our sin. Of course, on our own, we, we don't really want to kill our sin. We want to take it down off the cross. We want to play with it some more. We want to make a peace treaty with our sin, but that, that's not what God's calling us to do. He calls us to, to kill it ruthlessly, viciously kill our sin. Don't make peace treaties. Don't take it off the cross. Let it hang up there. Let it die. This morning, before we go any further, ask yourself this question. What sin do I need to put on that cross? What sin do I need to kill? Later, we're going to have a chance to, to make a commitment to, to, to do that very thing, to declare war on your sin. First step to change is to crucify your sin. Secondly, second step is to walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Now, see, it's good and wise to spend time evaluating our heart and life. We don't do it enough. In our age of distraction, we rarely take time to be still and quiet at all, much less to evaluate our souls. But if you do involve yourself in this kind of inward-looking introspection, and that's all you do, you'll end up pretty miserable. Because the more you look, the more sin you're going to find, and you'll end up feeling pretty hopeless. You'll see all the ways you fall short of God's glory, and if that's all you do, you'll think, I'm a lost cause. 
That's why I'm so glad Paul does not leave us there. In addition to urging us to crucify our flesh, he calls us to turn to something better. In addition to just turning from something, or turning towards something better, he calls us to walk in the Spirit. And there's two verses that kind of pluck this out for us. Look back at verse 16. Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You know, when you and I walk, we very rarely just walk around. I mean, most of us, we're not just walking around in circles for the sake of walking. We walk because we're going somewhere, right? We we'll walk because we're walking towards a destination. And that's the case here. When you walk in the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, you're walking towards a destination. You're walking towards Jesus Christ Himself. And each step you take while you walk in the Spirit brings you one step closer to Him. So Paul says, walk by the Spirit. Take steps by the Spirit. Choose to grow in holiness. Choose to pursue Jesus. Verse 25, he says something similar. If we live by the Spirit... Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. The picture here is something like a group of soldiers walking in a line. And if you're in that line and and you're walking together, you can't just stop. You can't just turn aside and go where you want to go. No, you have to keep in step with those around you. Same is true with the Spirit. The Spirit serves to keep you in line, to keep you walking in the right direction, away from sin. And towards Jesus. In other words, growing in the Spirit isn't just about saying no to some things. It's about saying yes to something better. It's about making active, daily steps of obedience in Jesus. And each step pushes you further from your sin and closer to your sin. Each step pushes you further from your sinfulness and closer to holiness. You're saying no to some things, your sin, but you're saying yes to something far, far better. I think about it like this. Uh, I, I did the math. Thanksgiving Day is, is 95 days away from today. So just encourage you guys to start thinking about it. Now imagine that this Thanksgiving, this is going to be different. All right. Some of your family members have said, you know what? We'll cook the meal this year. You, you can just relax and sit back and have a good time. And so you're like, I'll take that off, right? And so you're hanging out with the family, sitting in the living room, and, and you're talking, and maybe reading the sales papers or watching football, whatever it is you do Thanksgiving. And you see on the table this big bowl of leftover Halloween candy. Okay? And, and it's not the good stuff. It's not Twix or Snickers. I mean, we're talking off-brand sweet tarts and Dollar Tree chocolate and, and, and like, uh, cheap suckers they give you at the doctor's office. Like that kind of stuff, right? Now, now it's mid-afternoon, and you're pretty hungry. You're, you're ready to eat. It would be really easy to, to look at that candy and stuff yourself on that candy, wouldn't it? Would, would you eat the candy? Some of you kind of... Should you eat the candy? JC says no. Why? You want want dinner, right? And in the other room, you're, you're, some other family member is cooking, cooking some delicious turkey, some, some gravy, some sweet potatoes, maybe some, some green beans, some okra. And then to top it all off, they made some homemade sweet potato pie and chocolate cake and a big cup of coffee, right? This is what's awaiting you, right? So when you say no to that bowl of leftover Halloween candy, you're not just saying no to bad candy. You're saying yes to a meal that's going to be much, much better than whatever you shove in your mouth. Listen, the same is true with the fruit of the Spirit. You're not just saying no to selfishness and pride and whatever sin. You're saying yes to a life of sweet obedience to your Savior that's going to be far, far better than that sweet potato pie you're going to have this Thanksgiving. At this point, you may be saying, I I like this in theory, Nathaniel, but but how? Again, how do I do this? 
Now, let me give you just some practical steps from someone who taught me this. Uh, just some practical ways to crucify your sin, grow in the Spirit. And I made a, a list of four things. If you want to write these down, great. If not, I'm going to post these to our website probably tomorrow. Four ways to practically kill your sin, grow in the Spirit. Number one, you've already said this, identify your struggle. Use lists like this one to show you where you fall short. Um, use lists like this or ask someone to show you what your cheap bowl of leftover Halloween candy is, right? Identify what that is for you. Identify your struggle. Number two, identify the opposite fruit of the Spirit. In other words, I struggle with X. What is the thing that is opposite of that? For example, if I struggle with anger, the opposite of that is love, right? If I struggle with pride... The opposite of that is, yeah, humbleness, humility. Uh, if I struggle with envy, the opposite of that is selflessness. Or lust, the opposite of that is purity. Or prayerlessness, the opposite of that is reliance on God. So, so whatever it is that you struggle with, find what is the opposite of that? If I killed my sin, what would I be growing closer to? Identify the opposite fruit. Number three, find Bible verses that address the struggle and the solution. Okay? Find Bible verses that address the struggle and the solution. Have you ever heard of a concordance? You know what a concordance is? What does a concordance stand? That's right. It shows you where verses are pertaining to a subject. I'm pretty sure we have some concordances somewhere lying around the church. Maybe in your Sunday school classroom there's some. Uh, so you, you, you look up a certain subject, right? Anger. And it's going to show you all the verses that deal with anger. Uh, or if you don't have a concordance, there's this thing called Google that exists out there in the world. And you can literally type verses about anger and it'll throw up four or five different web pages that, that, that show you those verses. So um, find those and just make a little list of those verses. So, uh, so one, identify your struggle. Two, find the opposite fruit. Three, find verses about both of those things. Four, Read one verse a day. That's it. You don't have to take a whole long vacation and just like read the whole Bible. Read each day. Just take one verse. Read that verse. If it doesn't make any sense, read the verses surrounding it to see what's going on there. And ask what that verse means for your struggle. Some of these verses you read will be just a little bit helpful. Some of them will be like a big smack upside the face, uh, in a good way, a good smack, a good smack upside the face, right? Take that verse, ask, what can I learn from it? And then pray it back to God. Seek to apply it for your life. For example, say your, your, your deal is anger. Your verse for the day is James 1, 19 and 20. And it says, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And so you could say, you know what, God, help me to be slow to anger. Help me to remember that my anger does not produce your righteousness. And so you reflect on that verse and you pray. And you do this day by day. A verse a day, a prayer a day. And if you get through the end of your list and you don't feel like you made any progress, you start back over and go through it again. But here's the point. Day by day, You'll be focusing on what God wants for your life. Day by day, it's kind of like riding, a, riding an exercise bike or doing any sort of exercise. You may not think you're making any progress, but over time, you like start flexing that muscle and like, yeah, I like how this feels, right? Maybe it's like taking medicine. The first couple days, you don't feel any help from that antibiotic, but after a while, you say, this, I feel better. Listen, the more and longer you do this, you take this targeted Biblical medicine for your soul, the stronger you'll get. And day by day, God will produce this kind of fruit in your life. So again, identify the struggle. Identify the opposite fruit. Find a verse about those things. Find verses and then re read a verse a day. I'm going to put these up on our website tomorrow so you can look at that if you want to. And, and I want you to know when I say these things, this is not just me standing up high from an ivory, not an ivory, a wooden pulpit and telling you what to do. Well, I don't do it. 
I've, I've identified something in my life that, if you, that I'm going to be working on the next couple of weeks. Um, will you join me in that? Will you join me in saying, God, where am I falling short of your standards? How can you help me grow in that? It would be really easy to not do any of these things. It would be really easy just to be content with the status quo, to do the same old routines day after day, to pay no attention to the state of your soul, and so five years from now you're exactly the same or maybe worse than you were today. On the flip side, it would be really easy to say, yeah, this sounds like a good idea, I'll do it, but I know, I know how it works. I've spent more time in a pew than I have in a pulpit, and there's, there's something called a magic eraser that's over these doors, and they, as soon as we walk out, like everything that we learn just kind of <laughs> evaporates. I've experienced that. Um, because we've got concerns, we've got lunch, we've got things going on, and we forget what we're talking about. So before we hit that magic eraser, I'm going to, we're going to have a time of, 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 uh, of self-evaluation. Uh, when, our, when we begin our hymn of invitation in a minute, I'm going to ask Miss Glinda just to play through a verse. And instead of singing, we're going to stay seated and, and pray and, and, and ask God to, to show us where we need to grow. And, and then after that, we're going to have a time of invitation where if, if you feel like God's calling you to attack a certain part of your life, then this is a chance to make that commitment. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray. Miss Glenda, if you'd come and lead us in, in song, and then we're going to have this time of uh, self-evaluation and, and prayer. Father God, we admit we fall short of your standards. We fall short of your character. You have more for us than what on most days we want for ourselves. So in just a moment, God, as we pray and as we seek your face, Speak into our hearts and lives. Show us maybe where we're falling short the most. And show us where we need to grow and give us the courage to say, God, I, I commit to addressing this part of my soul for the next week, for the next two weeks, for as long as it takes until you grow me closer to your son, God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.